We're going to stand together and sing hymn number 206, Blessed Be the Name of the Lord. I want you to really lift your voices to the Lord and sing this morning. Hymn 206, let's sing. just ask if there are any spontaneous prayers of praise. Let's don't ask the Lord for anything right now. Who just wants to praise the Lord for something this morning? Would you pray? Yes, yes. 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 Somebody else? Yes. Yes. Salvation. Salvation, eternal life. Yes. Somebody else. Yes. 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 I praise Him for this beautiful day. Yes. For help, Mister. Yes. Yes. So many 
people have asked how, how I'm doing, and that's just I thank this church for the prayers and the love. Yes. Yes, yes. Heavenly Father, we do just praise you and honor you and worship you today. We thank you for this privilege we have to gather here as believers to worship you, the living God. Speak to our hearts in this service today. And Lord, accept our thanks and our praise as we offer it in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Time of Christian Fellowship. Turn around and greet each other and welcome our guests especially this morning. together. We're going to sing it twice. Let's sing. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord hath made. That the Lord hath made. We will rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And be glad in it. you enough for giving us another day that you've made, Lord, the day that we can gather in your house, Lord, and worship you and sing praises to you, Lord, and hear the preaching of your word, Father. It's just a, it's an honor and a privilege to be here, and let us never take it for granted. We thank you for each person here today, Lord, and each family that's represented, Lord, and we ask your richest blessings on each one. Be with those of our body, Lord, who can't be here, those in the those that are sick, those in the nursing home, those that are homebound, Lord, we lift them up to you in a special way today. Lord, I ask you to be with our pastor this morning as he stands before us, Lord, hide him behind the cross and give him the freedom to speak the words you'd have him to speak, Lord, and, and open our hearts and minds that it would be received and we would not apply it the way you'd have us to. As we come to this time in our service, Lord, where we can worship you by giving a portion back to you of what's already yours, Lord, as you've commanded us to do. We pray that we'll do it with joyful hearts and thanksgiving for, for the blessings that you have given us. And uh, ask that you will use it and, and bring honor and glory to you, Lord. Forgive us of our sins. These things we ask in our precious name. Amen.
has been talking a great deal on the Holy Spirit in our Wednesday night services for the last several weeks. And I want to ask you this morning to just bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment as we prepare for His coming with the Word of God. Pray that the Lord, the Holy Spirit, will empower Him and use Him. And pray that the Holy Spirit will speak to us through this servant this morning. Would you bow and would you pray? standing on holy ground and I know that there are angels all around let us pray on holy ground. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus to reach out and touch him and say that we love him open our ears Lord and help us to
Thank you, Brother Gary. Let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter 18 this morning. Luke chapter 18, we'll be focusing on verses 9 through 14. Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. I've made it a habit, a practice during 36 years of ministry to prepare churches for revival. That is, the churches that I have pastored. And uh, this month makes 36 years ago that I began pastoring. And so I've, had a, I've got a few years under my belt and I've often, um, you know, really sought the Lord and, and tried to discover ways in which I could prepare a church for a revival meeting. You know, oftentimes we call a series of services a revival, but we rarely experience revival. Um, along with many other pastors in our association, I've been gathering with them once uh, a week for the last several months to pray for spiritual awakening. We've been praying for ourselves and we've been praying for our churches. We've been praying for our nation that God will send a great spiritual awakening and send a great revival that will sweep our land. And, uh, you know, I, I'm thirsty. I'm hungry for that. I don't know if you are or not, but I'm certainly thirsty and hungry to see God do something special in the lives of his people. And I think that as a pastor, I have a responsibility to try to prepare you as my church family uh, for this series of services. And I've been trying to do that on Wednesday night, on Sunday night, and uh, we, we've been trying to do that through prayer. Uh, we've been, this past week, as Brother Doug mentioned earlier, we had one cottage prayer meeting, and that was a blessing. It was really a blessing. I think it was the best one, in my opinion, that we've had since I've been your pastor. Um, but we had a great cottage prayer meeting. We're having a prayer emphasis. You have your uh, Waken journals that you are hopefully working through and praying through every single day. And I hope that you, if you don't have one, you'll pick one up and you'll begin to pray between now and even through our uh, revival services. But today I want to share something with you that I believe, in my personal opinion, having been a pastor for 36 years, having watched people, prayed with people, having conducted many revivals, preached many revivals in 36 years, as well as conducted revivals, uh, you know, in my church, in churches that I've pastored, I want to speak to you today about one of the primary hindrances of revival. And I really believe this with all of my heart, and here it is. It's pride. I believe that pride is a primary hindrance to many people experiencing revival. And so this morning, I'm going to share on this subject. And I want you to look at this passage with me, Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 9. And if you would, please stand for the reading of God's Word. Give you a little break uh, before we get into the message. This is commonly referred to as the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. Listen at God's word. And he spake this parable, that is, Jesus spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. Now, the Pharisees were separatist. They were exclusively religious, very religious people, okay? The publicans were Jewish tax collectors. And um, it says that two men went up to the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that, thou, that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. In verse 13, And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. 
For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. You may be seated. Today, as we think about this subject, pride, a primary hindrance to revival, I want us to consider three things today. First of all, this is going to be hopefully brief and be to the point, okay? First of all, I want us to consider what is pride? Well, let me give you a very clear and concise definition of what pride is. It is the quality, pride is the quality of having an excessively high opinion of oneself or of one's importance. You find it there on the screen. Repeat it again. It is the quality of having an excessively high opinion of oneself or of one's importance. That's what pride is. The second thing I want us to consider is this. Look at the text. To whom did Jesus address this parable? Notice, if you would please, in verse 9. And he, that is Jesus, spake this parable unto certain. In other words, there were certain individuals that Jesus wanted to target that were listening to him. And it says that he spake this parable unto certain, watch this, which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Now I want you to notice this. Let's break this down and just briefly mention this. First of all, he says, I'm targeting those who trust in themselves. These are those who think and feel that they are self-sufficient. Have you ever met a self-sufficient person? Now, now, mind you, all of us need to have a certain amount of self-sufficiency. We need to be willing to work and to do things on our own. I mean, God expects us to work and to labor and to bring in money to provide for our families. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a person who literally trusts in himself for every single thing he needs in life. And that's who Jesus is speaking to here. Those who think and feel that they're self-sufficient and they have no need for anyone else. This is nothing more than pride, conceit, if you would please. Secondly, notice he says, those who are self-righteous. Those who are self-righteous. That is, these are those who have confidence in themselves, in their own goodness, that they, they feel and think that they have their own righteousness. And how do they prove that? They prove that by, by doing good works and do good deeds in order to secure the favor of God. And so they spend their whole lives working and making themselves good before God in order to obtain God's favor. Then he says, those who despise others. And the word despise here means to set it naught. It means to count as nothing. It means as unimportant and insignificant. And so what Jesus is saying here is these persons were persons that felt and acted as though they were above and better and more important and significant than others. In other words, we're looking head on at a prideful individual. Prideful, self-righteous, despising others, looking down his or her nose on everyone else because he or she thinks that they are better than others. Now, I realize that most people today, especially people in the church who are guilty of the sin of pride, that they may not feel or think this exact same way, but yet it is pride deep down inside of them. It is pride that is keeping them from being right and doing right. I'm convinced that many people inside the church of Jesus Christ, they do not get right with man or with God because of pride. Because what do we say pride is? Pride is a, the quality of having an excessively high opinion of oneself or of one's importance. And how many times have I heard people give their testimony? after having gone through a service and God's Spirit deal with them and bring them to the realization that they were filled with pride and how they needed to put down their pride and give their heart and life to Jesus Christ and, and make amends with their brothers and sisters in the Lord. How many times have I heard that through 36 years of ministry? 
And so I know what I'm talking about. Through my own personal experience, through my own personal life, through being a pastor and having dealt with people for 36 years, I'm saying to you today that pride is a primary hindrance to God doing a work in people's hearts and lives. People do not want to lay down their pride. People do not want to admit that they have problems. They're too embarrassed. So now the third thing I want us to consider, and here's where we're going to get it more into the meat of the Scripture, and that is this. We've looked, first of all, at what is pride, and secondly, we've considered to whom did Jesus address this parable. We've seen that. Now thirdly, I want you to notice this. Why is pride a hindrance? Why is pride such a problem? I want to take this passage this morning, and I want to show you five things in the life of this Pharisee Five things that reveals his pride. Number one is this. Watch this, verse 11. Pride refuses to admit its needs. Did you hear me? A person who is prideful refuses to admit that it has a need or has needs. Look at what he says in verse 11. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. In other words, he is saying, I have no needs. I'm all right, just like I am. There are many people in our churches today who are so filled with pride, they will never admit that they have any needs in their life. And that is exactly what this Pharisee was doing. He prayed as if he had no needs because he was not like other men. He says that in the verse. All men have needs. Every person has needs. Every one of us, we all have spiritual needs and physical needs, emotional needs. We all have needs, material needs. Every single one of us. How can we deny the fact that we are people who have needs? But prideful people have a difficult time admitting they have needs. And that is why that pride prevents some people from coming to God for salvation. Do you know that the first step to a person coming to Christ and being saved and born again is for that person to understand and truly believe that they have a need that they can't not meet themselves? that they have a need that only God can supply, that only Jesus Christ can meet in their life, that is the first step to salvation. It is coming to the realization that, hey, I need to be saved. The prideful person says, I don't need Jesus. I don't need salvation. And then there are those who are prideful who even come to the point in their life, they they, they will acknowledge in their own heart, yes, I need salvation, I need Jesus, but I'm not going down that aisle. And I'm not going to publicly confess Jesus before anybody. I don't want people to know that I have needs. I don't want people to know that I'm not saved. You know there are a lot of religious people today in our churches, people who have their names on the church roll that have been members of churches for many, many years who are lost and will bust hell wide open when they die. And the reason being is because they know somewhere in time God spoke to them, God dealt with them, God drew them, God convicted them, but they refused to walk the aisle and give their heart to Jesus. They refused to bow their head and bend their knee to holy God, and they're still living in their lostness and their sin because all they did was join a church one day. How many times have I I seen this happen throughout 36 years of pastoring? Sunday school teachers and pastors and deacons who realize through a process and by the grace and the goodness of God and the power of the Holy Spirit that they were lost and they needed Jesus. And it, it, listen, it cost them their pride. They had to lay down their pride and say, this is, this is my situation, this is my condition and I must make this right with God. And so oftentimes, pride refuses to admit it has has any needs. Secondly, verse 11, pride refuses to admit it can't meet its needs. Pride refuses to admit it can't meet its needs. He says, the Pharisee stood and prayed, God, I thank you, I'm not as other men are. I do this and I do that. He had it all together. I know people, I've met people throughout the years of my mission, they had it all together. Everything was together. Every time you saw them, boy, they were hunky-dory. Everything was going great. 
I want you to notice in verse something here. In verse 11, it says, The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Do you see that? Isn't that strange? Isn't that unusual? And the Pharisee stood and prayed with himself. He wasn't praying to God. Why? He didn't need anything. He was praying with himself. I wonder how many people there are in our world today that pray to themselves. Rather than praying to God, they're just praying to themselves. It says very clearly here in the verse, this guy was praying to himself. Why is that? Because he was not like other men. He didn't need to go to God because God, he already had everything God had to offer him. He thought. He didn't need the Lord. He could help himself. He could not see beyond his nose of pride stuck up in the air thinking that he was better than the publican. He could, not admit his, he could not admit his need. He could not admit that he could not meet his own need. Thirdly, pride, listen to this, pride is more concerned about man's opinion than God's. Pride is more concerned about man's opinion than God's. You say, what do you mean? Well, verse 11 again, he's standing. It said that he stood and he prayed. It's interesting that over in Matthew chapter 23, Matthew 23, listen at Jesus as he um, talks about the Pharisees. Remember, they were, they were very religious people. And here in verse chapter 23 of Matthew, beginning in verse 1, it says, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples. He's speaking now to the multitude as well as his disciples. Saying, listen to this now, he targets another group or two groups, the scribes and the Pharisees. Here we are again with these religious people, the Pharisees. The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves, that is the Pharisees themselves, will not move them with one of their fingers. Now listen at verses 5 through 7. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. Let me repeat that. Verse 5. But all their works, that is all the works of the Pharisees, they do their works to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries. That's the little boxes that contain the scripture that they had put on their forehead and on their arms. It says that they would, they would broaden their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at the feast and the, and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to call, be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. So it's very evident, this, this Pharisee that Jesus is talking about over here in this text, back in our main text. Listen, he was concerned about man's opinion more than he was God's opinion. He was more concerned about what men thought than what God thinks. There are a lot of people like that in our churches today. That's why a lot of people won't ever walk an aisle during an invitation even though the Holy Spirit is drawing them and he's convicting them and he's nudging them and, and compelling them to make a decision. They won't make a decision because they're afraid of what someone's going to say. They're afraid of what someone's going to think. And so they refuse to walk the aisle. They refuse to make any public. You say, preacher, why in the world do you preachers, do the majority of preachers, why do you ask people to go publicly anyway? Because everything that Jesus Christ did, he did it publicly. He didn't, he didn't listen, he didn't uh, try to cover up anything. 
Everything he did, he did publicly. He died for you and for me publicly. He died for the whole world publicly, hanging between heaven and earth on a rugged cross with pierced hands and feet and a crown on his head and blood streaming down to the ground. Jesus died for you and for me publicly. And he says in his word, if we're ashamed of him before men, he will be ashamed of us before our Father which is in heaven. And so I say to you, why not come publicly? It's a sign that we're not ashamed to identify ourselves with God and His Holy Spirit working in our hearts. You don't know what happens in your life when you begin to deny the privilege of walk, deny yourself the privilege of walking an aisle and showing people the Holy Spirit of God is dealing in your heart and your life. You never know when you're sitting next to someone the Holy Spirit is calling and drawing and he's wanting or she's wanting to go down the aisle and they're just standing there praying, Lord, if just someone would go, I'll go. And it may be God would have you go, that you would start the whole process and people may just flood the altar and get right with God. Who knows? But yet we have people in our churches today that will not do that because they're more concerned about what some man or some person's going to think rather than what God thinks. I'd rather be obedient to God any day than to be disobedient. I could care less what people think. Now certainly I'm, I, I, I'm concerned about my reputation. I want to live my life accordingly. I want to live like I should live. I want to have a good reputation among men. But I want to tell you something, folks. We need to put down this wall of pride that, that separates between us and God. We need to put down pride and say, Lord, whatever you lead me to do, I will do it. I'm totally and fully surrendered your will and your word. And I'm going to be obedient. I want to tell you, I, you know, I made a profession of faith when I was approximately 12 years of age, joined a church and was baptized, but I wasn't saved until I was approximately 25 years of age. And it took me putting down my pride to say to the church, hey, I've been wrong all along. I wasn't right. These religious people wanted to be seen of men. They were concerned about what men thought, what men would say. Well, let me share two more quickly and then I'll be through. Number four, watch this one. Pride always sees the sins of others. Watch this. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all I possess. Oh, listen, why did he say that? I'll tell you why. Because he was looking down his nose at this publican. He was too busy seeing the sins of this publican so much so that he could not see his own sin. Have you ever noticed that churches have inspectors Huh? I'm serious. They're, they're, they walk around and, and it's, it's almost as though God called them to that. They like an old hound dog sniffing on a trail. <laughs> trying to go around and find something in someone else's life that they can pinpoint. And you know what will happen when they do? Rather than trying to encourage someone and edify someone and lift someone up, they'll just stomp them that much further in the ground. I'm just telling you the truth. You won't find that a lot out in the world, but you will find it, most places you find it will be in the church. Because somehow we get to the place in our life that because we think we have arrived, everyone else is under us. I have some news for everyone here. You have not arrived and you will never arrive this side of heaven, nor will I. No one ever arrives. Paul made that statement. He knew he had not arrived. He says, but I'm still pressing toward that prize. Paul knew that he was not perfect. You nor I, we're not perfect. 
No one is perfect. No one will be perfect this side of heaven. Why should we look down our nose at other people? And why should we grind them in the dirt when we, when we see something in their life? Why don't we love on them? Why don't we encourage them? Why don't we edify them? Not in their sin, certainly not. But exhort them, as the Bible says. But pride always sees the sins of others. I want to give you one last one here. Verses 11, 12. All of these can be gleaned, I think, from these three verses. The last one is this. Pride is always right. Pride is always right. Pride is never wrong. You know, I've met people throughout my lifetime, really, even before I became a Christian and a pastor, that knew it all. No matter what you talked about, they knew more about it than you did. And they're always right. They never make mistakes. They never make any blunders. They're always right. That comes out of pride. The quality of having an excessively high opinion of oneself or one's importance. We ought to be like the publican. Look at it. Verses 13 and 14. And Jesus said in the publican, the other man, the man, the Pharisee, looked down his nose on the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven. In other words, he stood bowed down with his head bent but smote upon his breast. That, that tells me he was desperate. That tells me he was genuine. He was honest with himself and he was desperate before God because he realized his weaknesses. He realized his need. And the public was standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven, but smote upon his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You see, that's where, that's where we arrive at the place in our life that what we say and what we do and what we feel and what we think really means something to God. That's when God begins to move. It is when we humble ourselves and we, we recognize our failure, our sin, and we acknowledge that sin and we ask for God's mercy realizing that he is the only one that can meet that need, realizing he's the only one that can be merciful, he's the only one that will extend grace and mercy to us because one of these days we will stand before him and give an account of our lives. It's acknowledging who he is. It's acknowledging that he's much greater than we are. It's, listen, it's putting ourselves under the umbrella of God's authority and God's power. When we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt us in due season. And by the way, Jesus goes on to say, watch this. He goes on to say in verse 14, I tell you, this man, that is the publican, the one who would not as much as lift up his eyes toward heaven, but the one who stood there humbly before God, bowed down with his eyes closed before God, listen, saying to me, oh, smiting, uh, smoting himself on the breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you, this man is the one that went down to his house justified and right in the eyes of God rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Exalted. You know what that old saying is, don't you? And it's biblical. Pride goeth before a fall. What did Jesus say? For everyone that exalteth himself shall be brought down, abased. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. I'm telling you, pride is going to keep a lot of people out of heaven. Pride keeps a lot of Christian people from walking in obedience to God. 
And pride will hinder a revival meeting because it keeps people so focused on themselves they will not surrender and submit their all to God. When the Bible says we need to be fully and totally surrendered to the Lord at all times. I want to ask you a question this morning. Now I want you to be honest with yourself and with God. Are you fully surrendered to God today? Your heart, mind, will, soul, body, everything you have, everything you own, everything that you are, are you fully surrendered to God today? And if you aren't, would you come this morning and totally, fully surrender yourself to God, your entire life, your family, your job, your money, everything you have, would you fully surrender that to God today? And would you be willing to say to God today, Lord, whatever you speak to me during this revival, whatever you say to me today, Lord, I will do. No matter where I am, where whoever is preaching, when I'm listening to the Word of God and the Holy Spirit convict me and I need to come and make a decision, I will respond in public obedience to you or I respond in obedience to you publicly before men and not be ashamed of your mighty work in my heart and in my spirit. Would you do that? Could you do that? If you're here this morning and you're, you're lost and you're not saved, you may be a church member. You may have been a church member for many, many years. I want to say to you today, if you're lost, listen, the Holy Spirit of God, I pray He will convict you of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. And you will come to the realization that you're lost and need Jesus. And you'll be willing to lay down your pride that maybe you've had for many years and walk down this aisle this morning and say, Pastor, I've been fighting this for a long, long time. And now God is speaking to my heart. And today I am fully surrendering my life to Christ. I give my heart and my life to Him. And you may be a believer and you're struggling with pride. I want to just ask you, I want to beg you in the name of Jesus, please deal with that pride this morning, would you? Just deal with it. Get it out of the way. And let God have His wonderful way in your life. Let's pray together. Father, today I've done my best to deliver this message. I pray that you'll use it to your honor and glory. I pray, Father, that you'll help us to realize how dangerous pride really is, why it is so detrimental to our Christian faith. Lord, I pray, speak to us today. And Lord, help us to respond in obedience to your Holy Spirit and to your word. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.